verses 1 through 10. Here we are taught that it is through Christ we enter into the way of God's loving acceptance, beginning in verse 1. Very truly, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way, is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again, Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and bandits, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes in only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Blessed are those who hear the word of our God and believe. Let us pray. Good shepherd, we hear your voice and recognize it, but are often too afraid to heed your call. Too often we follow other voices, even when they lead to destruction. Help us to not only hear, but more importantly, follow your ways. As we pray that the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth might be pleasing and acceptable to you this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You get what you deserve. You've heard that saying. It's a universal belief that stands the test of time. Many hold that those who suffer trauma, trials, and tribulations are being punished for some wrongdoing, like getting into a car accident after drinking two cases of yingling, or getting beat up because you decided to sleep with the wrong person's wife. Some might call that karma. But the story of Job and of Jesus counters this notion where the righteous, in fact, do suffer. In other words, we have to ask two basic questions. Is there a good, why do bad things happen to good people? And is there a biblical answer to suffering that doesn't blame the victim? Well, obviously, both the stories of Job and Jesus' persecution do just that. Job is tested by Satan, and Jesus dies innocently on the cross for us. But does this idea really, really translate to today? Do we sit quietly when someone maligns us or hurts us in some way? The fact is, my father and my brother made livings representing people who were persecuted or hurt in some way. And their job was to find justice for them, not advise them to roll over and take it. But that is exactly what our scripture lesson is implying. That when we are injured at no fault of our own, or we are injured helping others, then we receive God's approval. We're not to take revenge. We're not to go after them. We're not to speak ill. But how many, how many of us here today could say that they were willing, willing to help someone knowing, knowing they were going to get hurt? Well, believe it or not, some of us would. We see it today. Police officers, firefighters, paramedics, nurses, and hospital staff do this on a daily basis. But the vast majority of us would probably hesitate unless it was family, someone we really, really love. But think about how many grocery workers, pharmacy workers, janitors, numerous other service industry workers keep on working, knowing that every day they increase their risk of getting the coronavirus and transmitting it back to their family. These people and our first responders are living this scripture. By suffering in the same manner Job and Jesus did, at no fault of their own. Jesus sets the example for us to follow. When he was abused, he did not return abuse. When he suffered, 
He did not threaten, but he entrusted himself to the one who judges justly. Do we follow this example? When we are abused, when we suffer, when we're threatened? I mean, how do we act when there is not a pandemic or an emergency to respond to? We have decisions to make every day, and we can choose how we respond. The Reverend Lloyd Prater, in his article, Why Does God Allow Evil and Why Must Good People Suffer, says this. In order for, the, for human choices to have any meaning, we have to be able to choose bad things. My decision to love you, for example, is utterly without significance unless I also have the ability to hate you. The price of having Mother Teresa, who witnessed so powerfully to God's love, is that we also have to have Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler to witness to ideological hatred. God gives us the ability to choose. Choose God or choose to be separate from God. Choose love or choose the absence of love. Choose righteousness and justice, or choose unrighteousness and injustice. This righteousness, this scripture holds the very essence of Jesus' example for us to follow. But honestly, can we do it? Can we respond the way that Jesus did outside of emergency? I mean, let's admit, let's admit it. It's hard not to react. It's hard to walk in danger. It's hard to keep quiet when someone's lying about us. So how do we do it? How do we follow Christ's example? Practice, practice, practice. Using spiritual disciplines powered by the Holy Spirit. Spiritual disciplines that help us stay connected with God, such as prayer and or meditation. Bible or discipleship classes, morning devotions, confessions, or simply acknowledging our mistakes to God, worship as today, fellowship, self-care as taking time to rest, mission or service to others, and of course, generosity. These spiritual disciplines help us stay connected to God. The choices we make to hurt or heal, to practice spirituality, or separate ourselves from God, are ours to make. It's our choice. God gave us free will. God gave us forgiveness of sin. And God gave us eternal life. What we do with those gifts are up to us. So the next time you feel like you've been hurt or you want revenge, I want you to think about this story. A young lady named Sally relates an experience she had in a seminary class given by her teacher, Dr. Smith. She said that Dr. Smith was known for his elaborate object lessons. One particular day, Sally walked into her seminary class and knew that she was in for a fun day. On the wall was a big target, and on a nearby table were many darts. Dr. Smith told students to draw a picture of someone that they disliked or someone who made them angry and he would allow them to throw darts at that person's picture. Sally's friend drew a picture of a girl who had stolen her boyfriend. Another friend drew a picture of his little brother. Sally drew a picture of a former friend, putting a great deal of detail into drawing even her pimples on her face. Sally was very pleased with the overall effect she achieved. The class lined up and began throwing darts. Some of the students threw darts so hard that the targets were ripping apart. Sally looked forward to her turn and was filled with disappointment when Dr. Smith, because of time limits, asked the students to return to their seats. As Sally sat thinking about how angry she was because she didn't have a chance to throw darts at her target, Dr. Smith began removing the target from the wall. Underneath the target was a picture of Jesus. A hush fell over the room as each student viewed the mangled picture of Jesus. Holes and jagged marks covered his face. His eyes were pierced. Dr. Smith said only these words. Inasmuch as I 
and as, as, in as much as you have done it unto the least of these, you have done it to me. Matthew 25, 40. No other words are necessary. The tears fill the eyes of the students focused on the picture of Christ. A very valuable lesson was definitely learned. You see, Christ sacrificed himself to save the world, the whole world, and all people. The person that you have ill feelings for is one of those people Christ died for to save. So, may we always remember that we have choices to make. Some will hurt us, some will humiliate us, and some will show an ultimate love for our Savior. Let us continue our service with a hymn of response. Precious Lord, take my hand. Number 628, your hymn and on your screen.
that we will continue to thrive and be God's voice in this world. That we will come out of this stronger than ever. Now let us go to prayer. God beyond our knowing, yet revealed so personally in Jesus Christ. Help us to embrace the abundant life you have offered us. May we follow the example of Jesus, risking abuse and suffering for the sake of your children, trusting in your abiding care for each one of us until all join in praising you with mutual goodwill and joy. As today we mindfully ask that you watch over and comfort our friends in Christ, such as our homebound, those in life care centers, those in our prayer list, as well as those named here today. And we celebrate with you the saints of this church that serve your people in love. Now in a moment of silence, we ask that you hear those prayers to private speak out loud. Fully hear our prayer. May we keep these special people in our hearts and our minds and our prayers as we go through this next week. And let us pray the prayer that Christ has called us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And once again, I remind you that if you have Georgia concerns that you would like raised here, please send them to uh, either email me or the church, uh, or give us a call or call the church. It goes right to my cell phone, and we'll be sure to include them in the next week's service. Our cups overflow with the abundance of God's mercy. There is more than enough for all when we who break bread together are willing to share ourselves and our possessions. We offer Christ's healing example to a world shattered by selfishness, strangers to God and to one another. So let us consider going to the church's website at www.trinityreformucc.org and present your offerings to God online or by sending in your church envelopes as best you are able. Please remember that you need not be a member of Trinity Reform UCC to partake in communion with us. And here at Trinity, children are also permitted to partake in the sacrament with the permission of their parents. So please be sure to have your bread or cracker and your fruit of the vine or other juice available as we begin our communion meal. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. You who come to me shall not hunger. You who believe in me shall never thirst. Therefore, this table is for all who wish to know the presence of Christ and to share in the community of God's people. In the presence of all who hunger for spiritual food, we come to this table to know the risen Christ and the sharing of this life-giving need. God be with you. 
and also with you. Lift up your hearts and you lift them to God. Let us give thanks to God most high. It is right to give God thanks and thankfulness. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior, who was born of your servant Mary and shared in the joys and sorrows of life as we know. We celebrate Christ's life. We remember Christ's death. And we rejoice in Christ's resurrection. We take courage in the abiding presence of your Holy Spirit in our midst. And with all the prophets, saints, and martyrs, and all the company of heaven, we glorify your holy name. Now take your juice and hold it up. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Take and drink. Let us pray. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us at your table by granting us the presence of Jesus Christ. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and send us forth into the world with courage and peace, rejoicing in the power of your most Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, please join me in the blessing and commission. You have been claimed by God, our good shepherd. Know God, not as a stranger, but as a friend. God is our shepherd, we shall not want. God leads us daily and restores our soul. Easter continues for Christ lives in us. Jesus came that we might have abundant life. Daily we receive God's goodness and mercy. Our cups overflow with God's generosity. Let us devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings. Let us pray and break bread together. We find our lives in giving them to others. In Christ, we discover the joy of service. 
Amen. And now hear this pastoral benediction. As we go about our day today, might we remember that God is pleased when we help others, even when we are hurt in the process. Today we are seeing this scripture lived out in the lives of those frontline workers who serve us daily and put their lives in the line. Hopefully we can put a little piece of ourselves out there to thank them, help them, and support them. Not just during this crisis, but especially when it's over and they need regrets. We might be inconvenienced or even have to sacrifice a little, but at least we will know in our hearts that God is pleased that we live. So go in peace and serve.